rooftop main mount landing. The biggest thing going through my head is don't f it up. Ready to put my skids on the rooftop, and I was just like, what, what the heck am I doing? Contact. Seconds matter, and even one or two seconds sometimes would be the difference between life and death. The Heinz roaming around looking to hunt some helicopters. If he chooses to hunt us, we'll make him regret that decision. It's starting off, you know, sort of like an air policing action. Think about something maybe over Taiwan or Eastern Europe right now. Eventually, at some point for student training, it's going to escalate. Things are going to get spicy. Uh, people are going to get shot at. Hey, they got it. Team 2 got it. I don't know what I'm doing here. I plan it was atrocious. This happens, like you put guys like in a high stress scenario where like they're hit with a couple of problems. Dudes will start getting frustrated with themselves. Not everyone makes it through here. This is a pretty demanding program. There's definitely some concern. When the best Marine pilots are invited to the Weapons and Tactics Instructor Course, known as WTI, they have a chance to distinguish themselves as the elite of the elite. Combat exercises known as evolutions are their opportunity to show up and show out. The F-18 students have already gotten their first chance to make a mark, but now it's the Cobra's turn. They're less than one hour away from their first evolution known as Assault Support Tactics 1. In those crucial moments, just before they take flight, you can see in their eyes just what's on the line. How you feeling today, sir? Oh, I'm feeling good. I think they got a good plan. It's one of those events where uh, daytime, Lights are still on for them. Get to find out how it's going to go. So they, get, they made their plan. They get to go execute it real time. We've got um, live op four out there. So there's real enemy vehicles move around the desert. So we get to see how they do against them. AST-1 may be the first or second time any of these guys have ever employed in a tactical scenario against live enemy vehicles. It's a relatively small insert and extract. They know the gig before they go out there. They know what it's going to look like. And as long as their plan is solid, they should go out and execute it with minimal injects that are going to throw it off. During this session of WTI, there are six Cobra students invited to Yuma. And so far, all stand shoulder to shoulder, none distinguishing themselves from the pack just yet. For Carmex, every flight is a chance to make his case to rise above the rest even if he's relegated to a supporting role on this upcoming mission. Today I'm uh, House Zero One. I'm the uh, rescue mission commander. Basically, part of the whole mission, we want to have people ready to, you know, rescue our guys if an aircraft gets shot down. In this evolution, the Cobras will face off against an adversary helicopter known as the Hind a Russian combat helicopter straight out of the movies. The Heinz roaming around looking to hunt some helicopters. If he chooses to hunt us, we'll make him regret that decision. That's the number one thing we're looking out for is other aircraft that pose a threat. The Hind is flown by a retired Air Force pilot, John J.T. Toddy. To the students, he is known simply as Ivan. Ivan is a living, breathing bad guy. You never know when he's gonna show up and start shooting you. It forces you to be on your toes and be ready to go into action. During the evolution, the Cobra students must deal with Ivan while carrying out their mission to provide air support for helicopters, transporting a ground force to an area known as Combat Village. 
as the instructor, like I have the event list, I know what is and what isn't gonna happen roughly the, the right times. But there's still some free play aspect to it. I know around this time, we're gonna probably see a hind flowing through and then it's up to the students, how do they wanna handle it? The mission begins as routinely as any air operation can. But as they approach a nearby mountain range, the team spots Ivan and the enemy hind. Out zero two, Sally Ivan, 10 o'clock low. Carmax, who has hoped for an opportunity to shine, gets his chance. Out zero two, engage. Out zero one, free. Visual, tally, okay. The hind moves in to attack the ground force that the Cobras are tasked to escort and protect. Out zero two, breaking left in three. Carmex and the Cobras must respond quickly to defend against the hind's attack. Out zero one, in position. With all eyes on Carmex, he locks on to the enemy hind. Out zero one, guns on Ivan. I saw him. We got a good solution with our gun. Ivan, terminate. Egress east for kill removal. That ends the engagement. Ivan is defeated with a simulated shot, and Carmax has made his name known. I was happy with that performance. I'm not doing poorly, so that's positive. When you fly among the best, it's easy to doubt if you belong. But after his showing in the evolution known as AST-1, Carmex knows more than ever that he's among the very best in his Cobra class. I have an idea that I might have figured something out. I think I realized you want to provide solutions to people, not just problems that you notice because you have situational awareness. I'm realizing kind of what it takes to be the best, if you will. All pilots here aim to prove they're the best. But the WTI program is about the unit above all else, showcasing individual talent to service the larger goal. It's a lesson the Cobras are learning firsthand and one the Hueys have in mind as they head out for their first evolution. Teamwork is everything when it comes to the Huey. You're going to double check it? All right, we'll do that. Today, Huey student Tinkle will have a big opportunity to make his mark, working alongside crew chief instructor, Master Sergeant Daniel Basin. The relationship between the front and the back is extremely important. Pilots are generally officers. Crew chiefs are mostly enlisted. Trust is huge. I don't have controls in my hand in the back, so when we're pointing the nose of the aircraft at the ground, I'm 100% trusting them not to crash. And they really count on us to defend the aircraft and take care of the aircraft mechanically as well. So having a good relationship and understanding each other and knowing each other helps us work through a very dynamic environment. Today, we'll present a very dynamic environment as the Huey team participates in an evolution dubbed the Department of State Raid. But I think they're ingressing over this two-story right here. Yeah. Department of State Raid is a U.S. consulate evacuation mission. We try to create a scenario for the students that is a realistic mission that showcases kind of the exquisite ability of the Huey to be able to do assault support into a small space. At our disposal, through the Yuma Range Complex, we have Deuce Village, which has a building top that is rated to land a Huey. My other instructor, Major Slot Wart, put a significant amount of time in putting the correct players who are external support to make this super realistic training for the students. Okay, listen, I have a train. At our disposal was an actual operational SOCOM unit. The Department of State was available to us to be able to train, as well as the MSD or Mobile Security Detachment personnel, who are real world people doing real world things right now, who are coming out to actually get training as well. I'm gonna take this and we get some radio checks with you. Yeah. 
And this is kind of our first opportunity to really see how the students are gonna do in, in major evolutions. There's a lot of things that they haven't been exposed to, uh, and they're learning as they go. My role is to try to make it as realistic as possible. I have a sheet of rough timelines that I want certain things to happen, and then kind of let the students work through the problem sets, and they will just naturally reward themselves or hurt themselves throughout the evolution. Rewarding themselves or hurting themselves will depend on how they deal with an ever-changing, real-world scenario. Much of the outcome rests on the shoulders of the Huey student called Chopper. He's been tasked with leading the operation. I knew day one that we were going to do a Department of State raid and that my name was on there to be the lead student for it. I've never done anything like this, so planning and then briefing clearly is super important. We have an embassy potentially being overrun with Department of State people inside that need to be evacuated. The plan is to do a rooftop insert of a team of SEALs, one at a time. First one comes in, as soon as they're off, the second one's in right behind them. SEALs can take over from there, clear the embassy, and then secure the people. There's a lot of stuff going on at once in a pretty small area. A little nervous going into it, but once you get in the aircraft, nerves just kind of go away and adrenaline takes over. As Chopper takes the lead, Tinkle is close behind. The team will need to be quick and precise as they drop the SEAL team at the embassy. To simulate the hostile environment they confront in a real-world situation, a Marine unit acts as an angry mob of locals on the ground. WTI is all about pushing the student pilots, forcing them to react to the unexpected. In an effort to rattle them, the angry mob is ordered to become increasingly more hostile. The Huey students are dealing with a fast-changing scenario. The team decides to utilize a CH-53 transport helicopter to drop a ground force of Marines outside of town to distract the mob and establish a perimeter so the Hueys can make their move. red team got very focused on what was happening with the 53s that landed and evacuated the embassy nearly immediately. The U4 armed personnel just left the compound, slowing north towards the uh, landed 53s. With the hostile force distracted, all eyes turned to Chopper, the student mission leader who has an extremely tight window to land and insert the first team of Navy SEALs. The rooftop main mount landing, there's a very high amount of responsibility. If you don't set yourself up right, you're gonna mess it up 300 meters out, and then you're gonna have to wave off. Well, now that's minutes that it's gonna take to go all the way back around. So that's a lot of time that the enemy has to get ready, grab their guns, come out, and will shoot you. So the biggest thing going through my head is don't f it up. The landing requires a steady hand and firm command of the Huey. An opportunity for Chopper to show his stuff. Ford 
down one. He manages to nail the landing, but the job's only half done. Now, he must hold the aircraft steady while the SEALs make their exit. At that point, you're kind of like a fulcrum. The helicopter can kind of just go back and forth. So you got to really be careful with the power management or else you're going to have a helicopter that's shaking back and forth as people are trying to jump off of it. The chopper delivers the SEALs to the rooftop with precision. He's delivered and set the bar with a clean performance. Now, it's fellow student Tinkle's turn as he lines up his Yui for the second landing. Five, one, one, be advised. As Chopper is up and away, I am right behind him and, and ready to put my skids on the rooftop. And I was just like, what, what the heck am I doing? This is pretty awesome. Though his adrenaline is pumping, Tinkle holds steady, matching Chopper's performance and successfully deploying the SEAL team. What they did there is not easy. They were in and out quick, which is uh, paramount because it was daytime. So overall solid from those two. Roger. As the SEALs clear the embassy, the mission is a success. A good start for the Huey pilots vying to prove their mettle and distinguish themselves among the class. But there's no time to celebrate as the team heads back to base for their post-evolution debrief. In execution, they did very well, but certainly a lot of things to clean up. There's always 10 seconds that you can improve. S seconds matter, and even one or two seconds sometimes would be the difference between life and death. Today, for Department of State evolution, we weren't perfect, but we were certainly passing. Now, we'll see exactly how they react going forward, because the rest of this week will ramp up significantly for them. Every day at WTI, every evolution says something about each pilot in the program. With their first major test in the books, both Chopper and Tinkle have set a high bar, impressing everyone on the flight line. Unfortunately for F-18 student Niedermeyer, things haven't gone to plan. A critical timing error during his first evolution means he has to rebound fast. Not an easy feat with the mounting pressure. Every day brings a new opportunity, but those chances are already dwindling. When you talk, make sure you know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Said some dumb things that uh, there's critical moments, been better. right? So like, there's critical times when like the one calm call needs to be correct, right? For timing or for spacing or for deconfliction. If you miss that critical time, it's, it can have huge ramifications, right? So you got to nail it when the, uh, the time's right. <laughs> nail it the first time, really, yeah. is what it is. Get it right the first time. <laughs> Get it right every time if you can, right? <laughs> As the F-18 students wrap up week two of their flight phase, there's no time to dwell on past performance. They must prepare right away for their next evolution, known as AAW-2. It's a complicated mission with real-world implications one that could offer a shot at redemption for Niedermeyer. AW-2 is a defensive counter air mission. The whole thing starts off as we're putting a UN resolution, no fly zone. We're enforcing this no fly zone over this notional country, but there are bad guys that keep flying into it. So we have to go in and ask them to kindly leave. Otherwise they'll be engaged or intercepted or whatever. It's starting off, you know, sort of like a air policing action kind of think about something maybe over Taiwan or Eastern Europe right now. Eventually, at some point for student training, it's going to escalate. Things are going to get spicy. Uh, people are going to get shot at. Could be a good guy, could be a bad guy. And then uh, we have to respond appropriately uh, in kind and start shooting back, but only using like the amount of force necessary in order to like accomplish the mission. A little worried about this one. I was the fighter lead for this, so I was supposed to be coordinating all like the fighters and their execution. We'll see. Uncle's job specifically is to dope out exactly when we're gonna have fighters on station. 
you know, how many fighters we need to have in the lane at what time, and when do we think the bad guys are gonna like initiate like their full up strike operation, and do we have like all the force posture set to defend ourselves against that strike. There's a lot of red air that the um, staff has scheduled for them. Probably more redder than they've ever seen in any other training mission before. This year we had 36 red aircraft, maybe more, and we will constantly throw aircraft at them, forcing them to defend their protected asset over and over and over again, while they are also trying to manage the fuel time distance problem and have the appropriate number of aircraft within the airspace to continue to defend the protected asset with an appropriate number of missiles. Every evolution is a chance to distinguish a pilot among the field. And on this one, F-18 student Uncle plays a key role in its execution. Just a lot of airplanes, a little piece of sky. You got like seven hours essentially to plan it yesterday and brief all of it. And anyway, yeah, enough to, enough to make you nervous. Yeah. Easy and the other instructors will always be watching and evaluating it all. These guys will see. Um, I think I think Spritz was seeing the big issues in mission planning yesterday, so that's good. Niedermeyer, I didn't see him much yesterday in mission planning because he was working on like all the internal like, mission load stuff and everything. So we'll see how that goes. I think together, I think they'll do all right. We'll see how like the team overall does. I think they can do better. And then, so we just gotta get them there. All right, we'll see you guys in like six hours. Yeah. You ready, Uncle? Best of luck out there, guys. Whether Uncle is ready or not, a big moment awaits in the next evolution. Though the plan is clear on paper, he's got to keep his cool in the air. He'll be monitored closely by Harambe as they patrol the no-fly zone over the next few hours. On this mission, fellow students Spritz and Niedemeyer are in the supporting role. But Niedemeyer has little room for error this time around. The instructors are eager to see if he can bounce back on this air policing mission. Throughout the evolution, adversary planes, including V-22 Osprey simulating bad guys, repeatedly break into the no-fly zone an effort to rattle and provoke the F-18 students. Flash 6-1, commit, group rock, 115-85, bogey, low, flow. The first task that we had was to intercept a low-flying aircraft, which ended up being a tilt-rotor transport helicopter. Flash 6-1, Tally 1, tilt-rotor aircraft, rock, 115-85. We were able to detect them, and we told them they were flying in a no-fly zone. You have violated a UN-mandated no-fly zone. Turn east immediately, or you will be engaged. They're not responding to the radio comms, so you have to go join up on them. And now you're doing everything you can to slow down and not flush out in front of them, while they're trying to do everything they can to you know, shake you off their tail. And so you're in this awesome back and forth fight going up through canyons and valleys, trying to maintain correlation and line of sight and custody of this track and still maintain an offensive posture while still being always cognizant of the rules of engagement and the ultimate escalation of force. What are the implications if I shoot? What are the implications if I don't shoot? Hi there, last six one, Osprey turning east. All goes to plan as Spritz and Niedemeyer rise to the occasion, successfully chasing the enemy Osprey out of the no-fly zone. We were able to turn them around and have them egress back to their uh, side of the line. While that was simultaneously happening, our structure pilot was dogfighting with an F-5. Nothing in air combat goes 100% to plan. And during this evolution, the instructors throw the students a big curveball. They escalate the situation by declaring that enemies have opened fire, quickly transforming this peaceful patrol mission into an all-out war. Flight 6-2, single group hostile. Smoke in the air, defensive. 
As Uncle joins the fight, he quickly sees his mission plan has begun to unravel. I showed up in the lane and it was just mass chaos. Sound 6-1, target single group, rock 100095, 23,000, hostile, verge plot, latch 6-2, 5 groups, east of the no-fly zone. Latch 6-2, Salem 6-1, status, low high. I uh, kind of just like G-locked or like froze on the radio when I checked in because there's just, there's so much calm going on. I got my wingman, I can't even tell him what to do, so I can't comprehend what to do. It was kind of a mess. The allocation of assets became an issue when they didn't have enough people in the lane at one given time to handle the air picture that was coming, which was by design from my for, from from Red. Those guys specifically planned to have overloading assets at one specific time because they saw vulnerabilities in the tanker plan. The evolution is nothing like it appeared on paper. And then another unexpected turn. Salem 6-1, Singer 11, bearing 360, defending south. A simulated shot from a surface-to-air missile system from adversary ground forces. Hey, they got it. Team 2 got it. Uncle and Imes take a direct hit. Salem 6-1, you are dead. Happy kill. We were feeling pretty discouraged. We were that guy who got shot down. 99, Miser, 11, active. They were uh, flying around inside of a MEZ, a missile engagement zone, that they didn't realize it was there. We just didn't get any word that it had popped up or was active at the time. So they got tagged by a surface air missile and sent home. The simulated death of Uncle and Imes is a devastating blow to the operation but it's also an opportunity for Spritz and Niedermeyer to rise to the occasion and distinguish themselves among the class. We now know there's a missile system in the north because our good friends Uncle and Imes have now found that out the hard way for us. So we're stiff arming the missile threat to the north. We're in the lane to the south. And all of a sudden, the push comes. Sniper one, targeted. 99, Miser, tackle ROE in effect. Flash, bonsai, target middle group, two target south group. At that point, we start hooking and jabbing. We did go to a merge with an F5 and started turning with an F5. It's probably clear by now that the Marines have their own way of communicating. It's a language all their own. When Spritz refers to a merge up here, what he means is that two planes will pass each other in the same piece of sky like cars going opposite directions on a highway before moving into an offensive position to deliver a kill shot. It's always good to turn with those guys and go from that beyond visual range fight into that actual dogfight arena. Sniper engaged, left two circles. Last six one, anchored rock, one zero zero, 127,000. Sniper one, you are dead. Sniper one, copy kill. We killed him. <laughs> yeah, we got him. <laughs> Spritz, and perhaps more importantly, Niedermeyer bounced back big time with a confirmed kill. It's as positive an outcome as they could have hoped for after a chaotic mission. But for fellow F-18 hopeful uncle, there's no real upside. The missions left him feeling as lost as he's ever been. I got frustrated. That did not go very well, yeah. Things didn't go super sweet. The plan wasn't super fantastic uh, on how it worked out. We got out of the jet. I could tell like he was pretty upset with himself, uh, probably upset with everybody uh, a little bit, uh, just in the force package uh, in general. I don't know what I'm doing here. That plan, it was atrocious. Uh, Struggling. I don't know. Comms are a mess. I couldn't figure out what was going on half the time. This happens, like you put guys in like a high stress scenario where like they're used to winning all the time because they're very good at what they do. 
but if they're hit with a couple of problems that they can't solve or their athleticism uh, in the jet can't get them out of a jam because the planning was poor, dudes will start getting frustrated with themselves. We were rolling around in the dirt with an Osprey at the start of it. Oh yeah, we were having fun. Following an Osprey through these valleys down low and IDing him. Everyone here in Yuma aims to rewrite the record books, to redefine elite and stand out from the rest. But right now, in the wake of a failed mission, Uncle is questioning if he'll even graduate. Not everyone makes it through here. This is a pretty demanding program. There's definitely some concern. I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not leaving here at the end or leaving early at that, so yeah. are heating up out here as the pilots engage in evolutions one after the next. Each combat exercise ahead will grow larger in scale and even more dangerous, testing the students in ways they cannot fully imagine. Almost midway through the daunting gauntlet of WTI, pilots like Spritz and Chopper, Tinkle and Spaz are distinguishing themselves among the rest. Others like Uncle see their dreams quickly fading. The life of a combat pilot is lived in milliseconds, and that's the one saving grace for them all. One millisecond can change everything. 